Before I started treatment, I suffered from PTSD and I was uh, shot in Iraq. I didn't believe this thing would work. I went through, uh, I guess, about 17 treatments. For 12 years, I hadn't felt my foot. All of a sudden, I could feel my foot. The next thing that happened was is, uh, my attitude started to change a little bit, you know, and I started to appreciate things. I had uh, tinnitus. Bing, all of a sudden I can hear out of that ear and I don't have ringing in my ears anymore. I mean, this is, to me, this is big deal stuff. <laughs> you know, uh, I don't understand how it works. I just know that it's working. <laughs> My wife said that she had to tell me something two or three times before it, it would get into my head and I could remember it. It's, it's totally different. I'm, uh, I'm able to uh, remember things. I remember things from back when I was a kid now. For my first eight or nine treatments, my wife came with me. And she would sit in there and, and, and read a book or something while, while I went through treatments. And then it got better that I didn't need the GPS to get here. <laughs> it's still in my car, but <laughs> I don't use it anymore. She doesn't have to come anymore. When you have PTSD, um, you're, you're supposed to be like this. It's supposed to be fight or flee. This is fight and that's flee. Well, when you have PTSD, that narrows to here. So your flashpoints are like this. You know, something could set you off. I'm not like that anymore. I, I don't have that flashpoint anymore. The biggest thing is, is I can I appreciate life now the sacrifices she made to get me in here. I appreciate Dr. Mann who put me in this program. Dr. Mann, I just can't have enough appreciation for him, for what, you know, his vision of what this is doing. I have a positive outlook now instead of that negative outlook I had. I played Army for 22 years. I wasn't happy unless I was in, <laughs> in the Army. When I lost that, when they medically discharged me, I lost my identity, you know? I'm starting to have an identity again. <laughs> so, and I owe it all to Dr. Mann. We are appealing for funding for traumatic brain injury, and I think my clinic is a model for what the VA ought to be doing. I'm Dr. Lloyd Manchikas, MD. I've been a physician for 30 years, um, board certified in anesthesia, qualified in emergency medicine and critical care, and I'm certified to perform hyperbaric oxygen medicine. Uh, I wanted to treat traumatic brain injury in the largest collection of brain injured patients uh, are veterans by far. Virtually all of the veterans that I've seen have concussive injury leading to concussion syndrome. Some are serious, some are not, uh, they're more subtle, but I opened this to treat traumatic brain injury. So here at IPMA. We have the capability and the credentials to be able to treat our veterans and first responders with hyperbaric therapy for specifically traumatic brain injury. My name is Patrick O'Brien. I'm a certified hyperbaric technologist and a emergency medical paramedic. I've done hyperbaric medicine therapy now for 17 years, both hospital-based and private. Pat and I have 47 years of medical experience between us. Mine is as a physician for 30 years taking care of acutely injured patients, if they've had it, I've seen it once by now. I've seen enough brain injury in 30 years to understand the misery behind brain injury. And so I understand the science probably better than any of the practitioners that come through. I kind of think I'm a one of. Uh, serendipitously found Pat, actually he helped me build this. So he understands 
the mechanics of these chambers in and out and he understands the protocols and understands the problems that can occur under traumatic brain injury better than anybody. I'm not going to find anybody else like Pat anywhere. So he's a unique individual doing this. He also understands all the insurance complications that we're getting into. There's nobody out there that has our specific qualifications. They're just none. We think we get it, we're going to get it done better than anybody that's out there. And I think that IPMA HBOT is an excellent model for treating an injured veteran. They have pain problems, emotional problems, addiction problems, and the vast majority have injured brains. In this building, we provide a continuum of care. It ought to serve, we, I think it, would, it should serve as a model clinic for installation, in, at least in the VAs, which have no capacity to deal with pain and brain injury. All they can do is diagnose it and give the patient some drugs, which is ultimately ineffective. If you don't fix the anatomy, the software doesn't follow, and the patient still suffers. My personal attraction to being able to treat one is because in the critical care setting, I was able to see what hyperbaric therapy could do for those with traumatic brain injuries. Uh, my passion is because I myself could not personally serve in our military. Uh, this is my way of giving back. In the traumatic brain world, it has been studied. It has been proven that we make a difference. Um, unfortunately, until that traumatic brain injury is removed from the investigational list and put on the approved list, no private insurance will cover this. This is not a benign therapy. We must evaluate each and every patient, make sure that they qualify to be a patient. We set these patients up on a 40 treatment regimen, which is five days a week for a total of 40. We bring them in, we load them into the chamber. They're roughly in the chamber, an hour, 90 minutes, of 100% oxygen therapy is received under pressure. We'll do this until we see symptoms change for the better, and we will continue to treat them as long as those symptoms change for the better. At some point, there may be a plateau, and then we would reevaluate that patient and consider more treatment was necessary or not. Individuals are not productive members of society when they return from our military. For several different reasons, but specifically for traumatic brain injury, they're angry individuals. They're, they don't know how to express their feelings. They don't know how to fit in. They don't know how to be a productive member of society. The national statistics of 22 veterans committing suicide a day is real. Brain injury will suffer mood swings such that they'll get low enough to want to commit suicide because they're, they're in agony. <laughs> it's just not being able to think clearly or hold a thought in your head or walk from this room to that and like, damn it, why the hell did I go over here and having to backtrack and go back to where I was to remember where I was about to go and it, I don't know if that makes any sense. Uh, my name is Sam Seipel and my son is Scott. I'm Scott Seipel, I'm 43, I guess. About September 2004, he went to uh, Ramadi with the same group, and uh, they were uh, they went some heavy stuff over there. He got wounded twice over there. The third one was in 2009. I got hit with a 107 rocket, sort of took my arm and whatnot. So he said, "I looked down, I could see, you know, bone." tendon, muscle, you know, just hanging there like hamburger meat. The whole time in the hospital, they're giving you that Coumadin for blood clots or whatever, and it was a few days after, I don't remember, but I'd hit my head, getting out of the shower on the little shower rack, and thought I'd stopped it and went to sleep, and woke up soaked in blood, blood dripping off the bed, and it was just crazy things like that. And Tried to call, make a phone call, but didn't make to the phone. And ended up in Mexico one night. Like I came to, I was in Mexico. And apparently I'd crossed the border twice that night. I didn't have a wallet or passport or nothing. I had a wound back I was still wearing around. I don't know, I couldn't think straight or hold thoughts in my head or, or jumping out of my skin, and, you know. Whereas before he was so sure of himself and, and confident and everything, it was just the opposite now. His temper, you know, you know things happen and, 
and he'd lose his temper and he'd calm down and be all right. And then it happened again. Something that, w w things that bothered him that really wouldn't bother anybody else bothered him. Yeah, it drives you crazy because it happens so often. And that's one of the things I hope I could clear those cobwebs out of my head, you know? Think clearly again. Uh, how do you treat somebody like this? They treat them with, uh, you know, uh, therapy, psychotherapy, and they, and they treat them with pills. And, and it, it's like they get them on the pills and then that's the solution, keep them on pills. And that's not right. That's, that's his goal, to get off of that and to live a, you know, try to live a normal, productive life. As a result of receiving this treatment, they become productive members of society. It's not a pill. It's an actual treatment. What they get from this treatment, they will continue to have for the rest of their life. And for those who are severely affected, they become functional human beings. It's, it's not a psychotherapy. It's not a, uh, me trying to retrain you of how to think. It's an actual treatment. The science behind it is proven. So if we can just save one person, it's better than nothing at all but to produce a productive citizen to society that our military has trained will be golden compared to the alternative treatment, which is take a pill, sit in a dark room, and do not produce anything for society. And we do fix people and turn them back into citizens that are productive, functional and productive. It's been proven. If I'm gonna treat a group of patients, they are certainly the most deserving because virtually all of them that have traumatic brain injury suffer some significant disability in their life.